Um, anyway, I should explain that I am dismantling my studio. I am no longer using my typewriters. I'm no longer using my typewriters or my cameras, but I did save out this one speed graphic, my old comforting standby when all other mechanisms failed. You know, you had to have backup. I would have two cameras around my neck. I'd have 50, 100, 200 of these bubble flash bulbs because something always went wrong. But let me ask you to step back in time so I can explain how I became this photojournalist. Look, I used to love going on nature walks with my father in Mound Brook, New Jersey. We would find snakes and turtles. I'd put them under the dining room table. Sometimes I'd go into school with a snake around my neck. I craved attention. My father was an engineer. He was refining multicolor printing. And he was a perfectionist. Sometimes I would watch him developing photos in the bathtub. And one time, he took me to a foundry. And I know that is when my love of machines began. There were machine parts being made out of molten steel. And there was this sudden magic of flowing metal and flying sparks and heat and energy and power. I love that. His philosophy was, never finish a job until you have done it to suit yourself and better than anyone else requires you to do it. And my mother's mantra was, reject the easy path, do it the hard way. <laughs> so with those messages burned in my brain, I began Columbia University, 1921. But that January, my father died suddenly. I was able to finish the semester. In fact, I took a photography course from the famous Clarence H. White and concentrated on composition and design. But then I had to make money to continue my schooling. Well, I had already lined up a job at a camp as counselor for photography and nature. And my mother gave me a used IPA reflex camera with a cracked lens. But actually, it didn't really matter. People wanted their photographs in the early 1920s to look like paintings, sort of hazy. So I set up my own little shop at the camp, and soon I was selling photographs to the townspeople, to the staff, to the parents. And then I'm going to skip the next few years. It's too complicated. I went from college to college. But I finished my academic career at Cornell University, where the professors saw me photographing those gorgeous stone buildings and the library tower. And they suggested that I become an architectural photographer. Well, that hadn't occurred to me. So upon graduation, I moved to Cleveland. Some of my family was there. And that industrial city just spoke to me. There was Lake Erie and the Cuyahoga River running through it. There was the terminal tower going up and the high-level bridge. I spent hours experimenting with repeating patterns, abstract patterns, um, dark and light and shadow, because this was later in the 1920s. Pictorialism was out. Modernism was in. I met a man named Alfred Bemis. He was a clerk at a photography store. He admired my talent, and I admired his technical ability. Soon I had jobs with Union Trust Bank, with uh, the Chamber of Commerce. But I wanted to get into Otis Steel. Every night I went past that factory, I wrangled my way into an interview with Mr. Coolis from Otis Steel. <clears throat> well, I believe there's a power and vitality in industries that makes a magnificent subject for photography. It reflects the age in which we live, the machine age. And your steel mills are the very heart of the industry, with the most beauty, the most drama. Well, it will just be experimentation for now. No, I won't faint. I am not the fainting kind. <laughs> 
Well, Mr. Coolis said yes. I could go into his factory any time. And then he went off to Europe for five months, which was perfect. <laughs> Beam and I went into that factory night after night after night. We'd have the snow at our backs and this blistering heat at our fronts, blistering the wood off my camera. I was trying to capture the 200-ton ladle pouring out the molten steel. But all the red, the fire, the sparks, it was all black. And then miraculously, this friend of Beam's was on his way to Hollywood with flares. And when I used those flares, the white light provided the, the quality, the clarity that I needed. So I was able to capture the, the molten steel. And then, the 200 ton label. And this photograph won me first prize at the Cleveland Museum of Art. Uh, so when Mr. Coolis came back, he offered me $100 a print, almost five times what I was getting, and he wanted more. I wrote in my journal, I want to do all the things that women never do. I want to become famous, and I want to become wealthy. My jobs have increased. I've been hired by an architectural firm. Chrysler and Republic Steel are interested in my work for advertising. I've opened my own studio in the Terminal Tower, and I've changed my name from Margaret, or Peggy White, my father's last name, to Margaret Bork, my mother's maiden name, White. Has more gravitas, don't you think? <laughs> and then I received a telegram. have just seen your steel photographs. Can you come to New York within a week at our expense? Henry R. Luce, Time, the Weekly News Magazine. Well, I knew Time. I wasn't interested in photographing political personages. There were all these ore boats and trestles and trains and factories <laughs> waiting for me. But I suppose a few days in New York would be all right, so Mr. Luce, interviewed me with his rapid-fire delivery. Who are you? What are you? Why are you taking these steel photographs? What they were going to do was launch Fortune magazine, which would combine business and industry, and words and pictures would be partners. And they wanted me to be the first photographer on staff. Well, I signed the contract, but not until they had agreed to give me half of the year off for my advertising work and for my commission work. <laughs> I wrote to my mother, Dear Mother, I feel as if the world has opened up to me and I hold all the keys. But then came the crash. The stock market crashed. But Mr. Lou said, no, we're going ahead with fortune. So I moved to New York, and one of my first assignments was to photograph the Chrysler building as it was under construction, going to be the tallest building in the world, and my photographs would prove that. Sometimes I would be out on the scaffolding, swaying eight feet in either direction, as three men held my tripod, and I would get these shots of um, New York or the Chrysler building. And when they said they were going to put gargoyles up on the 61st floor, I said, that? is where I will have my studio, and I did. <coughs> Oscar Grabner took his picture. He was the photo editor of that fortune. I was never afraid of heights, never. <laughs> Didn't bother me at all. But then I had to have a backlog of stories for, um, for fortune. So they sent me out with the writers, with Archibald McLeish to the Elgin Watch Factory, with Dwight McDonald to Corning Glass Works, and with Mr. Luce to South Bend, Indiana. We covered the whole backside of South Bend. And of the hundreds of shots I took, I have to show you my favorite. These are plow blades, about to be painted red for the farmers. <coughs> 
Some people said they looked like the legs of the Rockettes. <laughs> Well, 1930, I was sent to Germany to photograph their rearmaments, which I did. But I wanted to get into Russia, land of tantalizing mystery. Nobody had been across those borders in years. They had the five-year plan going on. I thought with my enthusiasm for the machine as an object of beauty, it would be perfect to go into a country that's trying to industrialize almost overnight. Well, Mr. Lou said, no, we're covering Germany, we're not covering Russia. Well, nothing attracts me like a closed door. <laughs> I cannot let my cameras rest until I've pried it open, and I want it to be first. I had already applied for a, a visa, so when I got to the Russian embassy in Berlin, the men said, oh, your pictures will be your passport. But no, it was five and a half weeks. I was running out of food. I was running out of money. Finally, they realized this would be great PR for them. So a whole cadre of men suddenly accompanied me to the largest dam, to the collective farms, to the tractor factory. I had 800 shots ready to send them back to New York. But they had to be developed for the sensors. It took me the next 36 hours, the last six hours on my knees, rinsing out these photographs and hanging them all over my hotel room with two assistants. They invited me back the next two summers. Boy, I'll tell you, things were different. They were tired. Everyone looked shabbier. The women were longing for fashionable clothing, for lipstick. I came home and wrote eyes on Russia. And that became a pattern. I would do a major shoot and then write a book and then go on a, a lecture tour. You know, in those early 30s, I was doing a great deal of advertising work for Goodyear Tire, for Buick, for Eastern Airlines. TWA would put me in a small plane so that I could take pictures of their planes going across the United States. They'd take off the door, and I would lean out with my K-20 camera and capture the mosaic fields and the Grand Canyon. It was delightful. <laughs> I have to tell you, in those early years, I, well, it was a long time ago, I had men falling for me left and right, you know, pilots, musicians, <laughs> writers. But I tried not to get emotionally involved. Oh, you know, I sent one of my photographs of the new George Washington Bridge to Amelia Earhart, and she wrote, um, I have just returned to find your gift of the beautiful span. I think you've caught the spirit of the Washington Bridge subtly and exactly. Thank you for sending it as an example of photographic art and also as a demonstration of what ability lurks with women. <laughs> Sincerely yours, Amelia Earhart. Well then, 1934. Fortune sent me to Nebraska to cover the great drought. It wasn't called the Dust Bowl until the next year. I had a five-day deadline, so I hired a two-seater Curtis Robin airplane. We discovered it was all the way from the Dakotas to the Texas Panhandle. 16 million acres at that point of over-cultivated soil just blowing away. I wrote for my story in Fortune. This year there is an atmosphere of utter hopelessness. Nothing to do, no use digging out the chicken coops or the pig pens after the last disaster because the next one is coming along. No trying to keep the house clean. Vitamin K, they called it. The dust that sifts under the door sills and stings the eyes and griddly seasons every spoonful of food. It gets in the butter and the baby's milk. You know, suddenly, with these farmers in the Dakotas, I began to see everything in a new light. I thought I should give up some of my advertising work and do more <coughs> documentary work. And you know, the timing was perfect. You know Erskine Caldwell? He had written two books, um, God's Little Acre and Tobacco Road, and people thought he was exaggerating wildly. 
the poverty in the South with the sharecroppers. He wanted someone to document it. So that was me. We met in Augusta, Georgia. And it just took a few days to figure out who was going to be boss. <laughs> but then, you know, I got so I loved watching Erskine work. He had this quiet, receptive approach. He would wait until the subject revealed his personality, and then he would begin the interview. He was a southerner. He could mimic the, the inflection of every state we were in. I was the northerner. I would stay out of sight a bit. And then when things were comfortable, I would move in with my camera or use a remote. We wrote this book together. You have seen their faces. And it's interesting because when the reviews came out, people said it's almost as if the pictures tell the whole story and the words are supplemental. So as we traveled through Mississippi and Tennessee, Arkansas, Alabama, um, Erskine and I, for five months, we fell in love. And something else major happened in 1936. Mr. Luce decided to launch one more magazine. So he had time and he had fortune. Now he was going to launch Life. He hired four photographers, Alfred Eisenstadt, Margaret Burke White, Peter Stackpole, and Thomas McAvoy. Each of us was sent to a separate location. I was sent to New Deal, Montana to photograph a Fort Peck dam as it was under construction. Now, New Deal was a frontier town. It looked like a movie set. It's not even there anymore. There were welders and engineers. There were quack doctors. There were ladies with boas. Everyone went to the bar X at night. The bartender put her baby on the bar. There were five cents a dance taxi dancers. I was sending all these shots back to New York. And I got a telegram saying, what are you doing? <laughs> I said, don't worry. I have plenty of construction shots as well. Here are the diversion tunnels, for instance. Whenever I use something that is uh, this massive, I always put people in the photograph so you get an idea of the scope. <clears throat> and the editors of the paper of the New Time magazine said, photographer Margaret Burke White had been dispatched to the Northwest to photograph the multi-million dollar projects of the Columbia River Basin as only Burke White can take them. What the editors got was a human document of American frontier life, which to them was a revelation. You see, what we had created was the new photo essay, where photos tell the whole story. And then they sent me to the Arctic tundra <laughs> to photograph the new governor general of Canada as he went about in a steamboat meeting his new constituents. And at one of our first stops, a young radio operator came on board and said, does anyone suit this telegram? Um, Honey child, Arctic Circle, Canada, I love you, I miss you, Erskine. Oh, <laughs> and at the next stop, Honey child, Arctic Circle, I can't go on, I need you, come home, Erskine. Why can't you come home and marry me? You know, we had been through this often. <laughs> the very secret of life for me was to maintain, in the midst of rushing events, an inner tranquility. I had chosen a life that dealt with tragedy, excitement, human suffering, human conflict. And in order to document that and know what I was doing, I had to have a sense of serenity as a kind of balance. I couldn't have somebody begging me to come home every minute. <laughs> honey child, honey child. <laughs> well, then you know I was invited to the White House. And when I sent my shots, I mean when I sent my packet to the White House, I had written enclosed are many photos of the president and his staff, and especially one of the electricians who said, they always promise, but they never keep their promise. I want to be the exception. And then Mrs. Roosevelt, 
the First Lady invited me to the White House at Christmas time to photograph the whole family. And she wrote a charming note. Artist, genius, wonder woman. I have never seen such pictures. They are really extraordinary. I hope we didn't wear you out. Everyone firing questions at top speed. Do come and see us again when you have time to spare, and we can just sit around. Sincerely yours, Eleanor B. Roosevelt. Well, do you think Eleanor Roosevelt ever has time to just sit around? <laughs> I doubt it. Then 1937, um, there was a great flood in Ohio. I was sent to cover it. Um, I got the last plane in and hitchhiked in a rowboat and uh, came upon a bread line. <clears throat> now, it turns out that there were hundreds of these photographs of these billboards. They were sponsored by the National Association of Manufacturers trying to tell us that things were all right, we have the highest standard of living, the longest, the shortest hours, the highest wages. But it was the Depression. Some of the Farm Security Administration photographers like Dorothea Lange and Arthur Rothstein went around the country looking for these ironic situations. Dorothea found on Route 99 in California, Americans with the highest standard of living over a squatter's camp. And in the south, the Southern Pacific Railroad was putting them out. And there's a lovely family looking out the window. Next time, take the train. And down below are all these people walking with their suitcases down the highway. So while we were dealing with the Depression, uh, Europe was dealing with growing war clouds. Erskine and I went to Spain and Czechoslovakia in 1938. We were going to write another book together. And first thing, we came upon a Nazi rally. This is Bohemia, Czechoslovakia. These are Sudeten Germans being whipped up into believing that they are a repressed minority. So in this land of readers, the bookstores were closing. The, I lost my train of thought. Anyway, all of the books were being lost. The superb theater of Prague was ordered to close. Erskine and I avoided our escorts, and we went off into the countryside. I was arrested for my cameras, but we got out of that. So we interviewed people and were able to come back and write north of the Danube, listing some of these steps toward war. And then, you're going to think I'm crazy, but I decided to marry Erskine. <laughs> I decided if I marry him, maybe he won't be so desperate to be with me. But we married in Silver City, Nevada, and he signed my contract, which said he would try to control his mood swings, and he would not attempt to take me away from my assignments. Now, 1941. The Nazis and the Russians had formed a non-aggression pact, but the Nazis, my editors were sure the Nazis were going to break that pact. They wanted me in Moscow before anybody else. So Erskine was coming along. He had his own reporting to do. We could not go through Europe. We had to go all the way through China. That's when I photographed Madame Chiang Kai-shek. It took 30 days with these small airplanes coming across China, coming across Russia, landed in Moscow just as the bombardment began, and we had a hotel room directly across from the Kremlin. Um, this was spectacularly gorgeous and terrifying and noisy. You just wanted to go down into the subways and cower, but I did not do that because this was my job. So anytime the hotel people came around to see that we were out of the room and down in the subways, 
We hid under the bed. I had five cameras, 22 lenses, 3,000 peanut flash bulbs, and all of my developing equipment, 600 pounds of luggage. What's happening here is the Russians are sending up flares so they can see where the planes are. The Nazis are sending down parachute flares so they can see what to bomb. There are trajectory bullets coming over here, which can change, you can change the trajectory. Um, so, 22 days we had all of this going on. But one night, um, Erskine went off to do a radio interview, and I went over to our embassy. I always kept one camera at the embassy. So I was out on the balcony, and you could hear something coming. You know when something's coming in, the whole atmosphere changes. So I went inside against a wall, and that night all the windows in the embassy blew in. But all this time, what I really wanted to do was interview Stalin. So finally, Harry Hopkins, Roosevelt's envoy, allowed me in to meet Stalin. He was shorter than I thought, and all pockmarked, not at all what you see in these giant posters all over the country. He, he looked like he was made out of concrete. I said, would you like to sit down? Nothing. I said, remember, I photographed your mother in the early 30s. And the interpreter said, your mother, your very mother. Nothing. So I got my camera ready. And um, at that point, I dropped a whole pile of bubble flash bulbs. So as I was crawling around, picking those up, he burst out laughing. I turned around, got my camera. He has just a bit of a smile still on his face. Now, 1942, we were in the war now. They sent me over to England to photograph our B-17s as they came over. And I received a telegram from Erskine asking for a divorce. <laughs> well, that was not unexpected. We had three good years with many, many tempests. <laughs> he was moving to Hollywood. I was not going to move to Hollywood. <laughs> I have to tell you, it was a great relief. And I was, I, as I've always said, work is something you can count on. It is a lifelong friend that never deserts you. So I asked General Doolittle if I could go on a bombing mission. He said, no, that's too dangerous, but you can go on a troop ship. So here I was on a troop ship going to Africa with, a, with my newly accredited Army Air Force uniform, hat, jacket, pants, skirt, 6,000 British and American troops, 400 nurses who envied my pants, the first five wax, and Kay Summersby, Eisenhower's driver. There were rumors that we were being stalked by a submarine. And then one night, we were torpedoed. I grabbed my bag. I threw out all my clothes, put in my Linhoff camera, my Roloflex, my best lenses, rolls of film. I had the life belt on my shoulder. I had the helmet on my head. Everybody was very calm. We'd been through this twice a day. Got into lifeboat number 12, which was half filled with water from the Torpedo. Then we got down into the water. It was wildly rough, and our rudder was broken. People were bailing with their helmets. They were sick in their helmets. Uh, all of the other ships in the flotilla moved away. They did not want to bring attention to us. One of the uh, lifeboats capsized, and we took in a nurse with a broken leg. This is the only time I was ever actually afraid. One lifeboat went by, and people were singing, you are my sunshine, my only sunshine, you make me happy. And finally, um, in the morning, a British plane went by, and people waved, and I got out my cameras. So we were saved, most of us. 
and who should be the first person I see in Africa, but <coughs> Jimmy Doolittle said, Maggie, you want to go on a bombing mission? Mm -hmm. I said, you know I do. I'm not going to quit asking. So now, I was in a secret spot in the Sahara. <sighs> I had lost everything on the ship. The Signal Corps loaned me this high-altitude flight suit and the K-20 camera. They said not to take off my electric mittens over 20,000 feet, and now I've lost the number, because I would freeze my hands touching metal, and I would need oxygen over 10,000 feet. There are 10 men on a bomber. It's tight. It's tense. Brigadier, Brigadier General Atkinson and Paul Tibbets were climbing and diving and swerving, but I was used to that due to um, my, all of my work in airplanes. It wasn't until we returned I realized they were shooting at us. But they, they had a successful mission. They bombed a German airfield in Tunis, Tunisia. Now, I don't know if any of you have people in the Italian campaigns. They sent me to Casino Valley, which was called Purple Heart Valley. It was a disaster. There were all the enemy in the top, and we were in the valley. So anytime something came screaming in, we'd be diving into the mud. This was a medical unit. So I interviewed and photographed every single person, doctors, nurses, troops who were injured, and sent this all back to the Pentagon, as I always did. And they lost it. Twice during the war, they lost my brother. <coughs> Full story, but that one I never got over. And then, as the war was winding down, I was sent up in airplanes to photograph all of the bombed out cities of Germany. And then I was attached to General Patton's Third Army as we came upon Buchenwald. Now, Buchenwald had been freed the day before the Nazis had fled. These men I asked to stand behind this gate, they were the only people standing. Everybody else was dead or dying. Uh, General Patton was so incensed by what he saw, he asked his MPs to go to a nearby town and bring back 1,000 people so they could see what their leaders had done. They brought back 2,000, all of them covering their faces so they wouldn't have to see. People uh, ask me how I'm able to photograph these atrocities. Well, I think it's because the camera is between me and what I'm doing, what I'm seeing. So finally, uh, I was able to leave the decay of Europe and I was sent to India to photograph Mahatma Gandhi, 1946. Now, India was on the threshold of freedom from Britain. And Gandhi was telling them, if we spin and weave and make our own textiles, we won't have to import from England. So when I went for my first interview, the secretary said I had to learn how to spin. <laughs> so I did. And then I was allowed in, but I couldn't speak, because Monday is a day of silence. And he does not like bright lights. I was only allowed three flashes. Later on, he called me his torturer. Um, he was very quiet. So I went in and uh, took the first shot. It, it didn't work. I don't know. I took the second shot, but I forgot to pull the slide. So I got the third shot, and I was able to capture him. And you know, Gandhi's creed is nonviolence. It's sort of like the spinning wheel is his perfect weapon <laughs> for nonviolence. I accompanied him to Simla for the Freedom Talks and back to New Delhi, where he lives with the untouchables, the lowest caste. He thinks that the Hindus and the Muslims should live in peace in India, but Muhammad Jinnah in the Pakistan area thinks that only the Muslims should live in Pakistan. So wars broke out, terrible violence broke out. 
I went back to the States. I wanted to do a great deal of research on India. Came back in 1947. They had the great migration going on. I don't know if you remember. Hundreds of thousands of Muslims were moving up to Pakistan, and hundreds of thousands of Hindus were moving down into India. I photographed the gorgeous architecture, the saris, the jewels, the street people, the untouchables. Um, Gandhi had just come off a six-day fast. He always fasted when he was making a point about nonviolence, and some of his own Hindus were retaliating. We talked about the caste system. We talked about land reform. And that night, on his way to evening prayer, he was shot and killed by a Hindu fanatic. Well, then I also went to South Africa during apartheid, went all the way down into the bottom of those diamond mines. You can barely breathe down there. And then jumping to 1952, I wanted to go to Korea to do a human interest story. There were plenty of very talented war photographers, David Douglas Duncan and all kinds of people. But I begged and begged my editors, and finally they said yes. So I went to Korea, South Korea, stayed around for two weeks, again diving into the mud, and finally found my story. A young man named Jim, Kim Churl Jin, 29 years old, had joined the North Korean army because it paid more. Then he realized he'd made a mistake. He somehow got out of there. He was going to be escorted back to his town, and I asked if I could come. Well, this was hard. He was going to go back to his town. His brother, people would think he was a traitor. So we got in a Jeep, drove and drove and drove and drove. Got to his town. He saw his brother and made up with him. He saw his wife and the new baby he'd never seen. But the story was his mother who was in another town. So we got back in the Jeep. She thought he was dead. Drove and drove and drove. And suddenly he 